<sighs> How's it going, everybody? Look at this little view, huh? That we set ourselves up. Today, I'm gonna be doing a little neighborhood tour of Midtown East. La la, That's right. Money. It's pretty much just this giant area, but it's got little pockets of residential neighborhoods, tons of history. It's gonna be a good one. A lot of people spend a lot of time here, don't know anything about the neighborhood. Per usual, I'm gonna teach you a little something. Before we start, Cam, how are you? Ready to learn. You're ready to learn? You look it. You look it. You can't tell right now, guys, but he kind of wet himself a little bit. Uh, anyways, uh, before we start, guys, check out the Patreon if you've already seen these videos. That's how we fund these things. Got extras on there. Uh, also, like and subscribe, baby. If you've seen one of these already, you know it's going to be good. Uh, get it out of the way. That way you can just sit back and get your, your jiffy pop. I don't know what you guys are eating, you freaks. And watch the video. Anyways, uh, we got a lot to get to. Cam, should we just start this thing? Let's go, baby. Oh, by the way, this is the Queensboro Bridge behind me. Very pretty. We're going to talk about all this stuff later, uh, but let's get going. First things first, Midtown East isn't really a neighborhood as much as it is an area that has smaller neighborhoods as part of it. So this area here around 45th and 48th on the East River, we're close to the water right now, had an area known as Turtle Bay. It was this actual bay from 45th to 48th. Huh? Pretty cool. Had a little creek going down a couple blocks. Uh, really nice, huh? Now, around that area were two major farms. One was Turtle Bay Farm. That was from like 41st to 49th, big spot. Another one was Beekman Farm, owned by a man named James Beekman, who built a place called Mount Pleasant in the 1700s, mid-1700s, uh, at about 51st Street. Uh, and this was like a little, uh, well, a big mansion. But what's interesting about that house is that it was actually taken by the British during the Revolutionary War and used as an outpost. And was where, they say, Nathan Hale famously was tried went before being hanged as a spy for the Union Army. Uh, you know who Nathan Hale is, Cam? So Nathan Hale was a 21-year-old kid, basically, who was caught as a spy. They say he caught, they caught him in what is today Queens, and they tried him at the greenhouse of the Beekman Farm. Pretty cool. He famously, his last words were, uh, I, my only regret is that I have but one life to lose for my country. Huh? Those famous, 21-year-old kid, that's a lot of maturity. If I was 21 years old and I got caught spying, I'd be like, bro, Come on, bro. Come on, let's settle this over a game of beer pong or something. Ah, come on, this is no chill. So this was all farm until about 1811 when the grid was implemented uh, of New York, which, which they implemented the plan, but then you had to actually follow through and made all, make all the roads all throughout the island of Manhattan. This is when the streets were laid out, the avenues, all that stuff, that's a big deal. You had to go up to people and tell them, hey, we're gonna take this barn, demolish it. Hey, we're gonna make this road right through the middle of your property. It took a lot of legal battles. It took a lot of, you know, getting threatened with guns and stuff. Cause you can imagine going up to someone and say, hey, I have this court document that says you gotta go, or this has gotta go. You know, a New Yorker here is just gonna be like, yeah, yeah, I gotta, I'm gonna invoke my legal right to uh, take a walk. Huh? So then in the mid 1800s, you had developments come up once these streets are gridded out. So behind me, you have an area known as Turtle Bay Gardens. This was built in the 1860s by a man named Clarence Dean, uh, very famous uh, architect back then. And he had the Italian style, very pretty, but there's actually gardens in between here on 48th and over on 49th in the middle, very pretty. Uh, that's enough talk about how pretty it is and the history. Why don't we go inside and check it out, huh, Cam? Let's do it. Just kidding, <laughs> they didn't let us in there. They're like, uh, what do you got, a YouTube channel? Nice try, buddy. You ain't no Mr. Beast. Come back to us when you got a bigger following. And a lot of celebs actually live here because it's so pretty and have lived here throughout history. So for example, Katherine Hepburn, huh? Steven Sondheim, whoa, E.B. White, wow. Mary Kate Olsen, huh? I guess that's what the kids would call a dream blunt rotation. Um, you know who Mary Kate Olsen is, right? She was, the, you know, all you Gen Zers watching, probably interested in that, she was in Full House. I guess that was the 80s, so you probably don't care. Uh, Fuller House, how about that? She, didn't full, uh, she wasn't actually in Fuller House. I guess they, she, okay, look, she, she was famous back in the day, all right? Relax, what do you want from me? They probably have phone chargers in there, okay? You can watch your TikTok or whatever. But this is a Turtle Bay Gardens, a pretty little, you know, development put here once, uh, you know, the streets were gridded out. Huh, nice. Remember, it was still kind of, the, the city was still pushing north at the time. But this is just the beginning, baby. We still got a lot to cover in this neighborhood. So what do you think, Cam? Should we keep it going? Start moving. All right, let's go. There's a lot of history in this neighborhood. Uh, people don't really realize it, but one of the big things that happened happened in 1863 right behind me. 
I'm at the end. Cool motorcycle, bruh. Anyways, this is 46 and 3rd behind me, and this was the location of the spot where the first draft lottery took place in July 1863. This was the beginning of the famous New York draft riots, the bloodiest riot in American history. So, a uh, little bit of background. So during the Civil War, New York was kind of on the fence in a lot of ways. A lot of people here had lots invested in the slave trade and also in the cotton trade, which relied on slave labor. 40% of exports here involved cotton. That's a big deal. And not to mention all the banking, the insurance, the different underwriters, etc., that were also invo involved in the trade. So there were actually a big part of the people who kind of didn't want uh, to side with the union for that reason. So there was a lot of tumult, not to mention the fact that the media companies, etc., got all, everyone worked up over this influx of potentially uh, freed black labor. So a lot of the Irish especially took issue with that. In early 1863, the actual draft law is passed, creating a draft for the Union Army, but also letting people opt out of it if they could pay $300, which is today's equivalent of like $6,000. So imagine how pissed off you would be if, you know, you had to go to war and, you know, some tech bro could just get out of it by foregoing one month's Patagonia vest budget. Yeah, it wouldn't make you very happy. So this is kind of what set the stage for this draft that happened on July 11th, 1863. 1,236 names are pulled. Two days past July 13th, they're gonna do it again. Everyone says, no thanks. They start fighting, they start you know, bashing stuff, and it got real, real ugly. The houses of abolitionists are targeted. A lot of these are Irish people, by the way, who are basically revolting, and black people in the neighborhood and in the city are targeted really severely. Uh, people are lynched, people are burned, people are, are drowned on the piers. It was a total nightmare. A colored orphan's asylum, located where today uh, New York Public Library is located, was burned to the ground. Over 200 orphans had to run for their lives. Uh, miraculously, they weren't assaulted, but people all over the city were assaulted. The official death toll was 119, but they estimated it went up to over 1,000 people. This is crazy. And in fact, when they tried to build that orphan asylum after all this riot, the people in that neighborhood said no and basically blocked it from being built. Can you imagine that? What kind of sick people get? That just shows you that even back then there were, there were Karens. You know, I guess they would have been called Henriettas or Agathas. <laughs> Look at this Agatha complaining to City Hall. The actual riots weren't quelled until July 16th when a New York regiment of actual federal troops, Union troops, were sent in from Gettysburg to quell the riots and they were basically, uh, I guess, stopped. Um, kind of insane uh, period in New York history. Um, and, you know, it, they depicted in the movie Gangs of New York. Have you ever seen that movie, Cam? Martin Scorsese? You have not seen it. Well, just like slavery and discrimination in the United States, that movie went on way too long. This all had a huge effect on the black population within New York as well. Keep in mind that the population was over 12,000 before this riot. After uh, the riot, uh, it went down under 10,000. And the population that was here in New York City dispersed to other parts of the city rather than be here in Midtown near all this stuff. They went to places like Weeksville, which I covered in my Crown Heights video. Watch that. I also covered this entire riot uh, in my Slavery and Racism video of New York. So watch that. Did that one a few years ago, so... <sighs> I was so young. Uh, but yeah. This is an important point because you got to remember, diversity has always been synonymous with New York, but that diversity has always been a struggle, not just in New York City, but also in the United States. And that's an important thing, meaning you got to keep struggling. Diversity doesn't come free. Inclusiveness doesn't come free, and it never has, and it probably never will. Um, that being said, that is all kind of depressing. So, you know, before we move over to our next spot, here's a picture of my cat. Aww. All right. All right, so I'm standing here in front of good old Grand Central Terminal, huh? Oh, totes fresh, huh? But this is actually a very important building for the Midtown East neighborhood because in 1871, the Grand Central Depot was built by Cornelius Vanderbilt, and it is where all the lines converge, the New York Central and Hudson, the New York and Harlem line, and the New Haven line. Big deal, 1871, it didn't look like this at the time. This was actually built in the early 1900s when the trains were electrified, and they created Park Avenue to the north, which actually used to be open air, all the soot and all that crap. Uh, I covered all that in my Grand Central video, just watch that, uh, but this, watch that, all right? Don't think I'm just saying this, but um, that actually created, a, you know, kind of a hub here in the neighborhood. So you had offices and things eventually come, but you also had industry. In fact, there were 18 uh, acres of slaughterhouses over on the east side, which I will talk about a little later, 
Uh, but you can imagine that that created an interesting environment. There's actually a quote here I wanted to read. A Midtown East resident uh, in the late 1800s was quoted as saying about the neighborhood that it smelled like shit. How about that, huh? Anyways, there was lots of stuff going on, and this was one of the big reasons why this became kind of a hub, as well as Midtown West. Um, but I don't have time to get into all this. There's so much to cover. Watch the Grand Central video. There's a lot more we gotta talk about. Ready to go, Cam? Let's go. All right, so we're talking about like the 1860s, 1870s. We talked about the Civil War. We talked about Grand Central. It's around this time that the neighborhood starts to once again build up. We talked about Turtle Bay Gardens, 1860s, but behind me is an area known as Sutton Place. It kind of stretches from like 53rd to 59th Street uh, here next to the, uh, the old Queensboro Bridge, 59th Street Bridge. It's called Sutton Place because of a man named Effingham B. Sutton, who actually developed this area. Yeah, that's a real name, Effingham B. Sutton. That sounds like, you know, he definitely owned a yacht. You know, he'd say, <coughs> Effingham, would you like to go down to the yacht club? We can talk about our disdain for the poor. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyways, he developed this area and it attracted lots of moneyed people. In fact, there were lots of actual uh, famous and rich people who moved here. In fact, this corner house was actually built by Anne Vanderbilt. She moved from Fifth Avenue in her huge mansion there. 2018 was recently put on sale by the widow to one of the heirs of the Heinz company. Huh? You know, the ketchup company? Anyways, how much do you think, Cam? How much do you think it went on sale for? $21 million. $21 million. That's about 5.3 million bottles of ketchup. Just to give you an idea, that's a lot of dough, man. Uh, so we're not, no joke. It's also here in the Sutton Place Park where people uh, actually, well, the, the picture was taken, eh, no problem. Where the picture for the poster of Manhattan was taken, huh? You know, Woody Allen, got, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was canceled a long time ago, but yeah. Someone should cancel this lady for walking through my shot. No respect. Also, like I said, other celebrities who lived here, people like Sigourney Weaver, huh? Uh, Marilyn Monroe, Ban Ki-moon, former Secretary General of the UN, and I am Pei, the famous architect. Another dream blunt rotation, come on. So that's Sutton Place, this area from 53rd to 59th, nice little residential area within Midtown East, all developed by Effingham B. Sutton. Effingham. That's right, it sounds like a nice way to say a curse word name. All right, so we get to the late 1920s and this area starts to build and it starts to build bigger. Remember in other videos I've talked about how the 1920s was probably the biggest building boom in New York City history. So this area is no exception, of course. And I'm standing now in Tudor City. Huh? Very nice, a little, you can hear the little birds chirping, huh? the squirrels digging, the pigeons, I don't know, crapping. Um, but anyways, this area was built uh, as a, the largest residential skyscraper development in history. Whoa, it's 13 buildings total, all built in the Tudor style from the years 1927 to 1930. Now, this, re this was built on a spot called Prospect Hill. So this area was basically farmland and was bought post-revolutionary war by a man named Francis Bayard Winthrop. I guess you got to pronounce it holding your jacket lapel or something. It sounds like a very fancy name. He must have sailed with our old friend, Ham B. Sutton, huh? And it all stayed farms until around 18, the 1800s. Remember, 1811 was when the grid plan was implemented. The grid plan was implemented by the city in 1811 and then throughout the 1800s was basically mapped out. Now it's interesting also when you look at the architecture of this building that it's basically built to face inland as opposed to out, right? You'd think that you want to take advantage of all the waterfront, but remember early 1900s, late 1800s, the waterfront wasn't what it is today. Think about it, all the stuff on the water is industry, is boats, piers, all the dumping of pollution and everything, all the smells were all on the water. So you gotta turn away from that. Pretty interesting, because even think about it, in the 1800s, where were, where were all the rich people living then? Fifth Avenue, you couldn't get further away from the water. Today, it's a very different thing. You know, you see all today, the waterfront is where all the Instagrammers are doing their selfies and all that stuff. 
you know, you take the selfie on the waterfront in the 1800s, it's a very different selfie. Uh, I don't know if you like having, you know, hog carcasses in the back of your shot, but that's what it would have been. It's actually for this reason that the waterfront is what's being developed today because historically it was industry and industry has left. That's, a, that's for another video. Now, it's also interesting to take a look at the architecture, very pretty architecture here in Tudor City, uh, very severe looking, huh? In fact, uh, you look up, you can see like, it looks like the Gothic, you know, kind of like uh, serious and almost evil looking. Oh, evil, oh, you can almost imagine it with the most evil things, you know, going on with it, like lightning bolts, ooh, and, and bats flying out, whoa, and restaurants that won't let you have a glass of tap water even when you've bought food there. Oh, evil! Which maybe for that reason is why here is where they shot the exteriors for uh, Spider-Man, where the Green Goblin uh, lived. Huh? I don't know, you kids like your Marvel movies? Maybe that got your attention. That's, that's Tudor City. Tudor City, which is right next to another spot, which we will talk about here in a second. Cam, what do you think? That was pretty good, huh? Love it. Let's go collect some cherry blossom flowers and get the hell out of here. All right, so this brings us to, I guess, the current day and what this neighborhood is known for. And it's pretty much offices, a lot of, lot of offices uh, here in Midtown East. Obviously, we talked about some of the residential areas as well, but for the most part, it is, you know, corporate headquarters, you know, Pfizer. Used to be located here, just recently moved to Hudson Yards. Huh? You know Pfizer, huh? Two doses of it. Uh, two doses of Viagra? Yeah, that's what I thought, you, you boner freak. Um, but no, they, they, you know, Pfizer's located here. You had Bernie Madoff's headquarters were over at the Lipstick Building a little further north. You guys know Bernie Madoff, huh? I don't know if you guys, you know, get, get off, get boners off of financial corruption. That would be your thing. One of the big offices that was opened here was opened in 1915. It's right behind me. This is the UN. This is the United Nations building. Uh, was actually put here in 1950. It was actually given to the United States in 1946. Uh, so in 1945, post-World War II, uh, the United States Congress formally invites the UN to open up here in the US. Oh, wow. And then in, in 1946, the UN accepts the invitation and then accepts the invitation here to New York, mostly because of a man named John D. Rockefeller Jr. You guys may know his name from, uh, you know, Rockefeller Center, helped start the MoMA, all these different things. But he bought a bunch of acres here on the east side here of Manhattan uh, that was mostly slaughterhouses. We talked about those already. It was really kind of disgusting area here, but he bought it and basically donated it to the UN. And that was it, that was it. The UN's like, free stuff. Yeah, let's put our stuff there. So that's basically one of the things that actually helped choose this over other sites in the United States that were being considered, for example, Philadelphia. That's right, it was almost in Philadelphia. How about that? Imagine, you know, Antonio Gutierrez walking to work and having to, after an Eagles game and having to step over a fan eating horse crap. Yeah, it would have happened in Philadelphia. And also, they were also considering San Fran and Boston. Boston, that's right, almost in Boston, you know? That's right, bang a UE a beacon, get your dunks and go past that wicked piss of resolution, Secretary General. That was my Boston accent. Was that pretty bad, Cam? Actually, I was impressed. Oh, thanks. That was off the cuff, you know? Anyways, this is the UN building, and you see behind me the 550-foot-tall Secretary building. All this was designed, well, a lot of it was designed by Wallace Harrison, uh, a very famous architect here in New York. And it was actually uh, architecturally very important. Now, keep in mind, this is 1950. These walls of glass are a new thing for skyscrapers. We know them all. Every building that's built now is a wall of glass, but this was a huge deal back then. So you have the Secretary building, UN General Assembly, um, a pretty, pretty important, uh, you know, building diplomatically here. And you have also all the different uh, missions to the UN around it. They bought up a lot of the nice buildings in the different neighborhoods, etc., to host their, uh, I guess, diplomats. There was also some interest in the United States having the UN here because they could keep their eyes on it. This is post-World War II, remember that. I mean, Europe was destroyed. Uh, they didn't want to set it up in Geneva because of the League of Nations and the stain, I guess, from the ineffectiveness of the League of Nations uh, and its history. So they're like, you know, let's set up in the US. They didn't get bombed and they didn't have their cities destroyed. And the US wanted to keep its eyes on what was going on, you know? What those sneaky dips are up to. The diplomats, that's what they call them, dips. So they, you know, that was one of the big uh, motivations too. Um, right across the street at 47th Street, you have Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza. Uh, and you might be thinking, oh, Dag Hammarskjöld, I think that's the brand of nightstand I bought from Ikea. 
No, he was actually the second UN Secretary General, and they created this little park that all the diplomats can go hang out. And another interesting fact is that this is actually extraterritorial land. It's not actually American property. Um, and before you get any ideas, you guys are already thinking, oh, well, perfect. I'm just going to go, you know, take all my unpaid parking tickets and take a tour one day and just camp out inside the, inside the UN. Not going to work because there is actually an agreement with the United States where you can actually pursue people on that land for purposes of criminal prosecutions, etc. So nice try. Pay those parking tickets, I guess, or don't. I don't really care. This is one of the many important headquarters that are located here in Midtown East. They are starting to build more uh, residential uh, buildings in this area of Midtown East. We're really close to 42nd Street here. And the purpose being that, you know, because it's so many offices and everything, you know, maybe you can get a bigger, better value. Um, value is relative also, by the way. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Uh, I ain't about to be able to afford living here anytime soon. A famous uh, resident from this area around here, Truman Capote, lived here for a little while. So, uh, all right, I digress. Let's uh, let's keep it moving. <sighs> well, we made it to the end, guys. We talked about Midtown East. Ooh, Lord, we covered a lot of ground. We talked about Turtle Bay, we talked about the development of the area, the Grand Central Terminal, we talked about Sutton Place, we talked about Tudor City, we talked about the UN. I actually have a lot of history in this neighborhood. I used to work here back in my lawyer days. Yeah, right next to where we talked about the draft riots. How, how dark can it get is the question. I also used to give tours to the diplomats over at the UN. Pretty, pretty neato, huh? You got some real experience here. Anyways, I'm rambling. Guys, I hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed the video, please uh, check out the Patreon. Lots of extras on there. Uh, huge help. That's what funds these things, baby. Uh, also, you know, like and subscribe. Do that. Um, you know, we made it. We made it, baby. We covered a lot. Cam, did you learn something? You guys probably couldn't hear him because he's so far away, but he said a lot. All right, guys, that's pretty much it, man. Go enjoy the view. huh? Go have myself a little churro or something. All right, well, see you guys later. Sick.